Good morning, everyone. It's good to see y'all. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Let's stand as we sing Victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story. How a Savior came from glory. How he gave his life. glad to be here today Amen. do you have the victory this morning Amen. the victory only comes from having that personal relationship with Jesus Christ his death burial and resurrection and he's alive today and that's why we worship him on this Lord's Day let's go to him in prayer right now Lord Jesus we love you so much we thank you for every person that's here to be able to worship you in spirit and truth we thank you for those that are online watching us as well we ask that you would speak truth into all of our lives and that we would be transformed and that our lives would be forever changed because we know who you are Lord Jesus we ask that the Holy Spirit would move and work throughout this service today we pray this in Jesus name amen you may be seated well you're off to a great start this week you're in the house of the Lord and we're able to worship the Lord in spirit and truth just so you're aware of this, we have our flowers here in loving memory of Waster Anderson. Man, we had a great relationship with each other. He was a kind man, and uh, I miss him 
we had a lot of good laughs together. And so remember his uh, legacy today as we look at these flowers. Also, are you excited about what the Lord's doing in your life? Anybody excited? Now, I hope you are because our hope is in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to thank all of you that prayed for my family and I as we were on vacation. We had a great time looking at that brown water in Galveston. <laughs> Made me think of Dennis Swanberg and that brown water, but it was clean water. There wasn't hardly any seaweed there, and we had a good time soaking up the sun and just being able to relax, rejuvenate. And I appreciate the text and the messages that I received from many of you that you were praying for us. And so I thank you so much for our wonderful church family. And so are y'all ready to continue to worship the Lord today? All right, let's get after it.
Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just, we love you so much. We, we thank you for another day. We thank you for the privilege to gather in your house, Lord. I just ask that you bless the message that Brother Nathan has prepared for us and that we receive it and take it and use it in our life, Lord, and all these things that we ask in your holy and precious name. Amen.
Well, I always enjoy listening to my favorite singer. One of my pastor friends asked me recently, he said, did you know that she played the piano when y'all met? I said, no, not when we met, but shortly thereafter. And I love my wife. She's my favorite singer, and I enjoy what she does for this church. Are you glad to be here today? Yeah. I can tell you're glad to be here. I'm glad to be here. And so this morning, we're going to be talking about a Christian's thought life. So if we're talking about a Christian's thought life, you want to make sure that your thought life is where it needs to be. Throughout the day, we have several pauses in our life. And what we think about in those moments determines who we really are. In fact, the book of Proverbs says it this way, Proverbs 23, verse 7, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Your thought life is who you are as a person. Johnny Hunt said it this way, You are not what you think you are, but what you think you are. When we meditate on things in our life, it reveals our mindset. Some of you right now, what you're thinking about reveals your mindset. Wrong thinking can be bad for your health. You see the warning labels that are put out there sometimes and says, Well, if, if you... Smoke this cigarette. It could be harmful for your health. And I want you to know this today. Wrong thinking can be harmful for your health. And so take your Bibles and find Philippians chapter 4. Would you stand as we read God's word this morning? We're only going to look at two verses as our passage of scripture today. But they are very important verses that I want you to underline and reference often. Because it will help us throughout life. The Bible says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. These things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me. 
These do, and the God of peace will be with you. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your holy word and how it speaks truth constantly into our lives. And help us to always apply everything that you say to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated here. Christ is going to introduce us to the real world. And how many of you realize today that we are in the real world? It doesn't get any realer than what we are facing right now. But I want you to know something this morning, that God is in control. And we need to be reminded of that truth. God is in control of our circumstances. He's even in control of what is happening in the United States of America because God is on his throne. Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning. He allows us to make choices, and choices are oftentimes an indicator of what we want to do with our lives. Now, I want to warn you about someone today that's going to listen to this message. It's the cynic. The cynic will say about this passage of Scripture that this is fantasy world. It can't happen. It's not realistic. But listen to me very carefully. What we set our minds on is very important. So first of all, I want us to see this. How we are to think. How we are to think. Now you say, well, preacher, are you going to tell me how to think? I'm not going to tell you how to think. But the Apostle Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's going to tell you how to think. And if I am only just reiterating what the Holy Spirit has inspired based upon the Word of God, then you can say that I'm trying to help you, guide you, in your thought life. Because what we think determines who we are. The Apostle Paul talks about the peace of God. And if you want to experience the peace of God, you have to understand that there are conditions to being under the peace of God. Now, he gives us here. And now I got everybody's attention. Six characteristics of a fixed mind. In order to be able to have a disciplined mind, we understand that we are under the peace of God. So first of all, he says, whatever things are true. True. Now I want us to think about this because we have to be thinking about the truth. It is reliable. It is genuine. It is sincere. It is valid. We have to think about honest things. And let me tell you this today. We live in a day and age where people love to promote things that aren't true. And I've said this on many occasions. People would rather believe a lie than they would the truth in many situations. Social media is rampant with lies. And how many of you know that a half-truth is still a lie? But it's very interesting how someone will take a half-truth and they will spread it like it's the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And so we have to make sure that we are practicing the truth. It is not deceptive. The Bible says in John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except by me. Now, be very careful today because some people will slander people with things that are not true. And if you've ever been slandered by someone, you know that it's not a good thing because people have to know you to know that you're telling the truth. And I want you to know this. Just because you think it may be true doesn't mean that it's always worth sharing. It could be true about someone's life, but it's slander if it's meant to harm the person and to hurt their reputation. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 14, gird your waist with truth and we must be a lover of truth and I hope that you love the truth and then secondly we see here whatever is noble that means honorable honest think about what is revered in life when it comes to the Word of God we dwell on the deep truths of God's Word when we see this word that's mentioned here in relation to noble 
It oftentimes is referring to our church leaders, how they're supposed to be respected and how they're supposed to be honored by the people of God. Now here at First Baptist Church, I know that you respect me, you honor me as your minister, but we should honor and respect all ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul was encouraging them to think highly about him as an apostle of Jesus Christ and to think highly of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Thirdly, we see that whatever is just, that means it must be upright, it must be fair, it's a virtuous life. When we deal with others, we deal with them from God's standard, not our own personal standard. Now, how many of you know that God has a standard for us to live by? And we don't compromise that standard. Now, the world and the culture may say that, hey, you go along with what we're doing and everything's going to be all right. But let me tell you this, we never compromise God's standard of living. We hold true to the word of God, and it is powerful in our lives. And then he says here, pure. Our motives must be pure. Now, let me ask you this. How do you know if someone's motives is pure? How do you know if there's motives, their motives are pure? You watch their actions. You watch what they say. You watch how they live their lives. And a question we need to be asking ourselves can it withstand God's scrutiny? If God knows what you're thinking, if he knows what you're up to, will God be pleased with what we're doing? If it can't withstand God's scrutiny, then that means we shouldn't be doing it. Our motives are going to be revealed in how we live our lives. And so listen to this. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 22, the Bible says this. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in people's sins. Keep yourself pure. You know, you have to be very careful who you hang out with because if you're not careful, you will participate in their sins. If they are rebellious by nature, they will lead you to rebel against God. And so you don't want to be doing the things that they're doing because if you're involved in that company that's going to be doing things that contradict the Word of God, you don't want to find yourself in those situations or those set of circumstances. That's why in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, the Bible says, bad company corrupts good behavior. Now, sometimes you may think people around you are pretty good, but you watch their actions, you watch how they respond to certain things in their life, and that's going to reveal to you whether or not their motives are pure. We don't drift. Now, how many of you realize that we have a tendency to drift? If we're not drawing near to God, we're moving away from God. At the beach last week, we were explaining to Reagan and McKinley what happens. Even though you think that you're in one place, you start to drift. And you have that place set aside on the beach where you can know that you have been drifting. In our own lives, Jesus Christ is that standard. And if we're not drawing closer to him, we're moving away from him. We are drifting. And the truth is, some of you are drifting today. And I know something about your own personal life. I can tell you that you're as close to the Lord as you want to be. You know how I know that? The Bible says if you'll draw near to Jesus, he'll draw near to you. You're as close as you want to be. And when you start to drift, the people in your life that care about you, they'll say, hold on a second. Make sure you're not moving away from the things of God. Paul says be pure. Then fifthly, he says be, be lovable. Be pleasing. Be agreeable. It speaks of harmony among the people of God, not strife. How many of you have realized this today, that you can walk into a church and you can sense, you can also sense unity among the people of God? You can tell if people are getting along with each other or if they're not getting along with each other. As Christians, we have this responsibility when it comes to our thought life that we are to be lovable. Don't criticize. Don't criticize. The, the word itself means toward love. People that have problems usually don't recognize that they have problems. But you can watch somebody that's very 
hypercritical of someone else and they are telling you based upon their own life that they have some problems and it has to be addressed. Zig Ziglar said the healthiest of all human emotions is gratitude as he was quoting someone else. Do you realize that there are some people out there that think fault finding is going to be rewarded one day? You ever thought about that? They try to find fault with everything they think it's some type of reward that they're going to get one day because they have found fault with people in certain situations. Hey, that's not how we act as believers. You can find fault with anything. If you came to this service today looking to find fault with me or someone else, you'll find it. But let me tell you, tell you this. You're not going to receive a reward for it one day. How many of you have realized that criticism is not one of the fruit of the Spirit? not there but when we love and we have joy and peace and we treat other people how we want to be treated then we realize that we are to be lovable and then also Paul says here whatever is a good report that means those that are admirable those thoughts that are praiseworthy now listen to me very carefully those things that are of good report. Have you ever noticed how in some places bad news spreads a whole lot faster than good news? But most of the time when it spreads, it's going to spread with some attachments to it. Things that aren't true. Things that aren't real. And Paul says when it comes to our thought life, we need to be thinking about these things that are of a good report. Those things that are praiseworthy. You know what that means? We're supposed to be positive. Now, Day, even to Christians and see if they are positive or if they are primarily negative. Adrian Rogers said these people are oftentimes prone to be gossipers. How many of you realize that gossip is just a form of insanity? A gossiper sometimes can be insane. I want you to think about it from this perspective. They say, well, I don't mean to gossip, but and then they gossip. Is that crazy or what? Do they realize what they're saying? I don't mean to gossip, but, hey, I think, as Adrian Rogers said, that's a form of insanity. They continue to gossip even though they know that they shouldn't be doing those things, and it's going to be harmful to other people. Listen to this. I want you to do something. Is your thought life important to God? It is. I want you to do this. Try not to think about an elephant right now, okay? Don't think about an elephant. Don't think about that elephant. Don't let it get in your mind. Don't think about that elephant. Don't think about it. Don't think about that elephant. Okay, so what are you thinking about right now? Republicans. <laughs> I thought somebody might be thinking that. That's why I used the elephant. So when it comes to the elephant, why is it that when we say not to do something, we have a tendency to do it? Our thought life is important. You see, we think about those things that are of a good report. How we think matters. The Apostle Paul says we are to praise God. Those things that are praiseworthy, we praise Him. Listen to this. Can we praise God for what we are thinking about right now? Can you praise God for what you're thinking about right now? Throughout the day when you have these idle moments, what floods into your mind? Things that honor God or maybe things that dishonor God. Your thought life is very important because it reveals who you are. You say, well, some things I just can't get out of my mind. Well, what are you thinking about? What are you focused on in life? Because these things that cause you turmoil in life where you can't even sleep at night, what's going on in your life? You say, well, I toss and turn. I can't sleep because I'm thinking about all these things. Well, think about your thought life. Your mind is the control tower of your life. God gave us a mind to be able to use it for His glory and for His honor. 
Our minds should not be full of selfish and negative thoughts. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Every thought should be captive to obey Christ. Every thought that we have. What are you thinking about right now? What do you think about through the course of the day? Are you thinking about things that glorify and magnify the name of Jesus Christ? There are things that we can do in our lives that help us to think according to the counsel of God's word because in order to be able to have the peace of God in our life, we have to understand that God is the guardian of our thoughts. How many of you want God to guard your thoughts? How many of you want your thoughts to be pleasing to Him? Now remember, what you think is who you are. And oftentimes what you think, if you don't have that filter there, it's going to come out of your mouth. And people that are around you, they're going to know that something isn't spiritually right in your life. Paul says, how we think determines who we are. Secondly, what we are to practice. Look at it, if you would, in verse 9. It says, these things which you learned and received and heard and saw. These verbs there, learned and received and heard and saw in me, are important. Not only do we think a certain way, but we practice certain things. Turn, if you would, to God, John's Gospel. John chapter 14, verse 21. Jesus says these words here. John chapter 14, verse 21. Jesus says, He who has my commandments and does what? Keeps them. It is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and reveal or manifest myself to him. So we have to practice the commandments of God. If you love God, you will keep his commandments. What are some of his commandments? One is you are to put God number one in your life. Another one is you're supposed to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Another one is we're supposed to be great commission Christians. We should be telling people about Jesus Christ. We keep all of the commandments of God, even the ones that we have the most difficulty with because they are God's commandments. How many times have you heard someone say, well, I don't like that. God is trying to prevent me from enjoying something in life. No, my friend, he's not trying to prevent you from enjoying something in life. He's trying to spare you and help you in life. God's not trying to get you because you're doing certain things that are wrong. He wants you to understand that he has his best in store for you. He has the best things for our life, but there's conditions on it. And then notice Paul says, you have learned these things from me. We've all learned some things in life. If you've listened well, if you have been taught well, you should have learned some things from your parents, your grandparents, your Sunday school teacher, your pastor. There are some things that you should have learned in life. And when you learn those things, you practice those things because you have been taught. And Paul says, you have been taught, now you must live. Now, you can't use the excuse, well, I didn't know any better. Because if you've been taught the word of God, if it's been explained to you, you've been told how you're supposed to live your life, you're without excuse. How many of you realize today that we live in a generation that wants to blame other people for their own actions? They try to blame others for what they're doing and they say, well, hey, I can do what I want to do with no consequences. No, when you learn certain things in your life, you live it. Paul said, you can use me as a godly example in your life. Paul would have these holy thoughts. and He says, you can look at me and you can observe my life and you can see that I'm living for Jesus Christ. I want you to ask yourself this question. As we've gone through the book of Philippians, who are the examples in your life? 
Who do you look up to? You say, well, I'm not sure I look up to anyone. Always look up to Jesus Christ. Always look up to those godly leaders that he's placed in your life to help you, to instruct you, to guide you. Because they're there for a reason. And you can follow their example. Children today, they follow the example of their parents more than they listen to their words at times. And if the words are not match matching the actions, then the children say, hey, something's not adding up here. They're saying one thing, but they're living differently. So a child can observe hypocrisy. But a child can also observe someone that's living the godly lifestyle that's pleasing to Jesus Christ and say, only if I can be like them, I can look up to them, then my life is going to be easier, not harder. Paul says, we practice these things. We live these things. What's your thought life right now? What are you thinking about? I got some of you, didn't I? Did you realize that Satan wants your mind this morning? There's a battle for your mind and for what you're thinking about. He doesn't want you to be instructed by God's word and his truth. He doesn't want you to listen to this message and apply it to your life. He wants you to just go through the motions. And then as you go through the motions, when you have an important test and you have an important decision to make, what do you do? See, if you know what the Word of God says and you know what God requires of our lives as far as practicing these things, then you know that when we think right, it helps us overcome anxiety in our life. Now, it's very interesting today, the Christians that are struggling with anxiety, worry, fearful, fretful, so many of them are struggling with these things that they go to the medical doctors and they say, hey, can you help me with this? And yet I wonder how many of them each Sunday listen to the pastor say that God has the cure for anxiety and worry. It's putting our trust in him and letting him take care of everything. Our thought life. How many of you have worried about things your whole life and it never came to pass? Some of you are worried right now. You're worried, you say, when is he going to finish this? When are we going to be able to go home and eat? When am I going to see that elephant he was talking about earlier? Why? What we think is who we are. What we practice in life reveals what's most important to us. Now, do you want to have preventive medicine? You listen to God's truth today, and God's word will capture our thoughts. It will reveal who we are, but we must put into practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, most of us want God whenever we want God. But I'll tell you this, you'll learn this if you haven't already, that we need God every waking moment of the day. We need him all the time. Not just when we're in an emergency through some stuff in life. We need him all the time. And if we'll trust in him, if we'll depend upon him, he'll give us that peace. Because he is a God of peace. Now, understand this. Don't think about things in your life that are in opposition to the peace of God. Don't think about those things. For some of you, this is what it's going to mean. People ask me this question. For some of you, it means that you need to turn the news off. If all you're doing is saturating your mind with all this negativity that's going on in our society, then I wonder why you're so anxious and worried about everything. Maybe watch just a little bit of it to see what's going on. But, but don't meditate on those negative things because before you know it, you're so angry at the world and you say, what is the world coming to? For some of you, it may mean turning off the radio because you're listening to all this negativity that's going on in the world. And you say, man, things are really bad. 
Well, if that's all you ever listen to, that's going to be your mindset. You say, oh, well, I can't help myself. I, I love all that negativity. Let's just be honest. Some people love negativity. If they have a problem, they want to make everyone aware of that problem that's going on. And I've learned this many years ago. Don't try to fix that problem. They don't want that problem fixed. They want to be able to take that problem to someone else, to someone else, to someone else and say, man, we got a problem here. But if you fix it and you say this is how you can fix the problem, they may not like you. That means they can't share it with other people. And you say, well, how do you know that? Sometimes people come to the pastor or they come to you as a friend and say, I have a problem. Will you fix it? And you tell them how it can be fixed, but they don't want it fixed. Why? They want to be able to share with people that are problems. Dwight Pentecost said, maturity in the Christian is not measured by what a man knows, by, but by what a man knows does do you know that we respond to things differently in life some of you respond to things like a little child will respond to situations just being honest with you you don't get your way you get angry you get mad you say I take my ball and I'm going home that's the way a little kid responds to things but some of you that are more spiritually mature you know that there's something that's going on in your life that maybe is beyond your control, but God is in control, so he's going to help you through the circumstances and through the situation. So let me tell you some things to do. Listen to Christian music. Listen to Christian music. Music that lifts up the name of Jesus Christ. I love to listen to, to Reagan and McKinley when they're taking showers at home and they're just singing to the top of their lungs the praises and glory of God. And I say, man, that's awesome. I wish I could sing like them. Singing praises to the Lord. And you know why they sing those praises to the Lord? Because that's what they listen to when they're driving down the road, when they're at home. They hear those lifting up the name of Jesus Christ. And then look at this. Meditate on the Word of God. Now, I'm not talking about a minute devotional time in the morning to, to check it off the list and say, I've read my Bible. You meditate deeply on the Word of God. You let God's Word get inside of you, and it will change your perspective on living. You won't be pessimistic about what we're facing. You'll say, Jesus is in control. He has a plan and purpose, and He allows all things to work together for the good for those that love God, for those that are the called according to his purpose. He's working something out. And you claim that promise. And then listen to this, spend time praying. Praying. How much time have you been praying lately? How much time are you praying? You ever noticed your thought life when you're praying? Are you able to stay awake? Are you able to pay attention? Are you focused on the things of God? Are you practicing the things that bring glory and honor to the name of Jesus Christ? Because in order to do this, if our thought life is out of control, it needs to be fixed. Now, let me tell you what I, I learned when I was a young boy. Sometimes when I was in class, I would have a hard time with daydreaming. Teacher would be up there talking about English or math things that I was not interested in at all and so my mind would daydream and maybe I'd be looking at the clock saying man when are we getting out of this class but then spiritually speaking when something changed in my life when I was listening to the word of God when we were singing praises to God man I said we can go on doing this forever and how many of you realize Heaven is going to be a miserable place for some people. Because here on earth, it's just a little bit of heaven that we're being able to experience. Worshiping the glory and majesty of God. It doesn't get any better than this. Enjoying all that he has for us. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 55. The Bible says this, Isaiah chapter 55, 
verses 8 and 9. Listen to these words carefully. The Bible says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. How many of you want to have the thoughts of God, the mind of Christ, captivating every moment, every thought of who you are? When you are able to see that and experience that in your life, your thought life changes. Therefore, your thought life is changed. What we eventually see is our actions start to change because we start to think godly and not worldly or carnal. Did you know that some people have carnal thoughts? It's more about them instead of more about God. It's more about what they want instead of what God wants. And let me tell you something, they'll spend their whole life not learning what God would have them to learn so that it can make a difference in their decisions and in their actions. Therefore, listen to this carefully, generations are affected by that. They would have been able to teach their children. Their children would have taught their grandchildren. And it becomes a generational curse instead of a generational blessing. And how do we get there? We have to practice what's most important in life. Now, I want you to notice something this morning. If you're listening, say amen. Watch how spiritually mature people handle situations in their life. Watch how they handle them. The Apostle Paul said, Y'all watch me. See what I do. And then you model my example. Watch and listen to how spiritually mature Christians handle certain situations in their life compared to those that aren't spiritually mature and you will see those childish tendencies in those people's lives. Now just to make you aware of this, just to remind you, when the Apostle Paul wrote this to the church of Philippi, where was he? Prison. You say, wow, how could he say all these things when he was in prison? The Apostle Paul practiced what he preached. He said, you follow my example. You watch me. Now, when people are complaining, they're grumbling. That's not what Paul was doing. He wasn't trying to blame others. He was spiritually minded and not carnally minded. Listen to this carefully as we draw to a close today. Spiritually minded people are kingdom minded people. They think big picture. What is God's kingdom going to look like? What is it going to be like? People that are kingdom-minded, they think more self-centered thoughts. What's in it for me instead of what is God trying to do in this situation? People that are worldly-minded, they're not as productive. They worry. They are anxious. And how many of you church today realize this? We all need the support of each other where's your thoughts where's your focus some of you have a hard time with that but let me tell you this as a little child it's okay to struggle with that but as you mature as you, then it's not okay because you know better you've been taught you've been instructed your mind has been focused on the things of God. And so, how many of you this morning want to praise God for the peace of God in your life? Philippians chapter 4 deals with the God of peace and the peace of God in our life. God will be with us. But let me tell you something. Listen carefully. If you ignore God, he will ignore you.
If you decide not to live for Jesus Christ, then my friends, there will be serious consequences for not living for Jesus. You say, oh no, I can live how I want to, preacher. Oh yes, you can. You can, but there's consequences. Not only for you, but maybe for your family and future generations. So how's your thought life today? Do you belong to God? Can you say with 100% certainty that you belong to God? If you belong to God, then you will think rightly and you will practice what you are thinking according to God's word. When we belong to God, he changes our thought life. We practice what we say. We teach future generations that being sold out to Jesus is the best possible thing we can do. So how's your thought life today? Do you have thoughts that honor God? And do you practice the things that you have been taught? With every head bowed, every eye closed. Today, do you belong to God? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? My friend, if you don't, there's no way your thoughts can be captivated by God. No way. But let me tell you this. If you will come to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if you'll live for Him, He'll change your life forever. He'll replace those worldly thoughts, those selfish thoughts, those, those carnal thoughts with His thoughts. And you'll look at the world with a different mindset. If that's you today and you want to surrender your life to Jesus in just a moment here, I want you to come and let me know that you want to give your life to Jesus. For others of you that are here today, you say, well, well, pastor, this really spoke into my life. I need to change my thought processes. I need to think about things that are holy, things that are righteous, things that are pure, things that are lovely, things that are truthful. So it will change my actions in life. My friend, that's all of us at times. But ask Jesus to speak into your life today, help you be the person that you need to be so you can have those thoughts that please Him. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for what you're going to do in this time of invitation. You have called us to come forward, not to stay put. You've commanded us to seek after you and not to drift. So Lord Jesus, move during this time pray this in Jesus name amen I want you to stand now as you stand he's going to play and listen to me very carefully this is time for you to do business with God as she plays you come and do business with him
Thank you so much. You may be seated here. Those of you that have watched us on Facebook Live, thank you for being a part of our service today.